Well, it was just a hobby like so many others, a bit of an expressive outlet, and I followed the usual course, you know, going to clubs and so on, meeting other fellow practitioners. And then, by pure chance in my reading, I discovered that there were other ways of doing it. And being a chemist, these other ways, which had long gone out of use, aroused my curiosity. Much in the same way that a composer might choose a key for a piece of music, I could choose a colour or even a surface texture for a particular image. I believe that we do have a common root, science and art, which is the observation of the world. It isn't widely appreciated that there is a strong visual element in chemical understanding. A chemist thinks in terms of shape and form, spatial relationships, filling space. I mean, these, after all, are ideas which are quite common to the artist and the architect and the designer. The difference being that the chemist is thinking about matter at the submicroscopic or atomic level. In the earliest days of photography, it was by no means obvious to the experts who were then investigating it which uh, metal exactly was going to provide the royal road to success. Uh, Talbot, on the one hand, was working with silver, and we know that that is now what has come down to us. And he is acknowledged as the uh, inventor of photography on paper. But Sir John Herschel at the same time, and in collaboration with Talbot, was working with gold, with platinum, with Prussian blue, with plant juices, a whole host of other ways of making photographic images. The iron compound that goes into the sensitizer is inherently unstable, but it doesn't decompose except when light falls on it and quite energetic light at that, the ultraviolet light that those tubes emit. So the light supplies the energy to lift that compound over the barrier and it decomposes. And then what is left, the decomposition products, react with the precious metal compound to precipitate the metal as the image. So you see, where the light has come through the negative, it's caused a chemical reaction which has precipitated platinum and palladium metal in the dark regions and where the light has been stopped by the negative of course we've still got the original yellow sensitizer. The image is almost complete now and all we have to do is put it through some wet processing baths to get rid of all this excess unexposed sensitizer. What appeals to me about the process is its handcrafted quality. No two prints are ever exactly the same and serendipity sometimes strikes and one gets a delightful result that one didn't expect simply because of small variations in the chemistry. At the turn of the century, platinum was a common medium for making photographs. If you went to a gallery then, you'd find more platinum prints on the walls and silver. So with platinum, all I've done is reinvent the wheel. But with gold, the challenge was just to make it work. Although it was obvious from the earliest days that it ought to be a wonderful medium for making images, nobody had succeeded in taming the chemistry. The special quality about gold, compared with platinum or palladium, is it gives this added dimension of colour to the image. It's not a real colour, of course. This isn't a colour photograph in the literal sense. The colour is determined by the size of the particle of gold metal, which is something I fix when I arrange the chemistry. The great excitement of the gold process for me is the whole range of colours that can be produced with this metal. Uh, it's unique to gold, no other metal in a state of fine division produces such wonderful colours ranging from blues and greens through pink, red, magenta to brown. Um, in fact, every colour but yellow, ironically enough. Mm.